If you are a loyal listener of Unfound, please thank the supporters at Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube for this content. And please think about becoming a supporter yourself. Nancy Trosh Garcia was a 28-year-old from Asheboro, North Carolina. She was from Mexico and a mother. On May 20th, 2018, Nancy allegedly left her baby with her ex-boyfriend's sister, with Nancy saying that she was heading back to Mexico. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. I'm sure you've heard the stories elsewhere, but surely more than anywhere, you've heard families complain about police on Unfound. So much so that although police will deny it, this has become a fact. Law enforcement is not responsive to families' needs if a case goes longer than a couple of weeks. Does not matter location, the level of law enforcement, the kind of disappearance. After a while, the police will stop receiving families' calls and they won't call the families back. Well then, imagine how much more difficult the situation can get when a family speaks nothing but Spanish and the law enforcement agency doesn't. Then on top of that, the family is in another country. Everything gets many times more difficult. Well, that's the situation we have with the disappearance of Nancy Trosh Garcia. She went missing here in the United States, but her family lives in Mexico. And today we're going to feature her disappearance in plain English. And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Linez's website, charlieproject.org. Nancy Trosh Garcia was born in Mexico. When she was in her early 20s, she moved to the USA. She may have been here without paperwork, but such things do not concern us at Unfound. She learned English. She got a job. But Nancy never forgot about her family back in Mexico. She spoke with them often, although she only went back to the country once after moving. Nancy met a man, and they had a child together. Everything was fine for a while, but eventually there were allegations of abuse and Nancy was not living with him at the time of her disappearance. So, on May 20th, 2018, the story Nancy's family was eventually told was that Nancy dropped her child off at her ex-boyfriend's sister's house. This was unusual, since Nancy and the man were not together anymore and things between them were not good. The sister claimed that Nancy said she was driving back to Mexico. Nancy was nebulous as to whether she would be back in a few days, a week, a month. Neither Nancy nor her car was ever seen again. Due to these circumstances, nobody in the United States or Mexico realized Nancy was missing for some time. With family in Mexico claiming they didn't know she was headed to Mexico, and Nancy's American friends thinking she was in Mexico. Eventually, border records were checked, and there was no paperwork saying Nancy or her vehicle ever went over the border since May 2018. If you're an astute, unfound listener, you're already saying that you've heard many disappearances like this one before will contemplate how much more difficult a case like this gets when there are international language and personal barriers as you also try to answer these three questions during the interview. Number one, would not a working theory be much easier to create if Nancy had allegedly dropped their child off at the ex-boyfriend's? Number two, That Nancy's car is still missing is a quirk in this disappearance, right? And number three, Nancy dropped everything in Mexico to move to the U.S. Could she not have done that again to start a new life in the U.S. or elsewhere? 
Nancy's family insists she would have never left her child behind voluntarily. The guest for this episode is Nancy's mother, Mary Garcia. Unfound News. For everyone, the newest Unfound Now is out on the YouTube channel. I analyzed the November 2023 disappearance of Caitlin Alice Massey White. And I ask a very important question. Is her leaving Ohio really a disappearance? You can decide for yourself. Next, for Patreon and YouTube supporters, the newest found episode is available. I go from disappearance to the discovery of Richard Hoagland. If everyone else would like to listen to this found episode, please sign up at patreon.com at the $5 level or join on YouTube. Finally, a huge announcement on an unfound disappearance is coming up in less than two weeks. Please keep your eyes and ears peeled. I will let you know when the disclosure will be made. A long note before the interview starts. This is the bilingual episode that I've been talking about since like early December of 2023. So I want to inform you as to how this all came about. Last summer, the summer of 2023, I contacted the Find Nancy Garcia Facebook page. I eventually got a response from Mary, Nancy's mother, on Messenger, but it was in Spanish. Using Google Translate, since I don't speak Spanish, she and I were able to have a fairly coherent conversation about Nancy and her disappearance. Mary put me in contact with a couple of people here in the United States who speak English who had been trying to help. At least one of those people spoke Spanish. In speaking to them, I hoped they would make good guests for Unfound. Unfortunately, and if they're listening, I don't mean to offend them. I did not find them to be up to my standards that I set for guests. As you know, I don't mind having guests who are not part of families. That's more common than you might think for Unfound. However, I default to people outside the family for two important reasons. Number one, the family itself wants coverage but is hesitant to do any media. And or number two, these people who aren't family have a very strong handle on the disappearance, the missing person, the investigation, etc., maybe even more so than the family itself. Frankly, I did not feel the people satisfied criteria number two. I deeply thank them for helping Mary and her family. However, for interview purposes, they didn't cut it. My opinion, and mine is the only one that matters. What I'm also saying is my standard for people outside the family to be on Unfound is much higher than the standard for family members. So I told this to Mary, but I promised her that somehow, some way, Unfound would give Nancy and her disappearance the attention they deserved, even though Mary speaks Spanish, I speak English, and there were no other English speakers that she trusted to talk to me. To be truthful, though, when I made her that promise, I had no idea how I was going to do that when I wrote that to her back in September or October of 2023. No idea. But then I remembered my former assistant Natasha speaks Spanish. Yes, she does not work on Unfound for me anymore, but she and I have kept in touch, and I thought very highly of her work when she helped Unfound for a couple of years. Thus, I sent Natasha a message, then I spoke to her on the phone. I put forth the following plan. I would create an interview outline, just like always. She would then convert it into Spanish, and then she would interview Mary using that outline and record it. Then Natasha would translate the interview into English. Natasha then brought up the fact that a friend of hers, Consuela, was also bilingual. This meant that when converting the Spanish interview into English, and recording it, 
Natasha could just play her role as interviewer in English, and Consuela could then be Mary in the English recording. This would then make it much easier for you, the audience, to understand who was who, in contrast to Natasha playing both herself and Mary in the English interview that you are about to hear. What you are about to hear is that translation done by Natasha and Consuela. Please keep in mind, Natasha and Consuela are not professional translators. They did this because they are both deeply moved by Nancy's disappearance, Mary, and the problems she's had with law enforcement in Asheboro, North Carolina. In addition, both Natasha and Consuela, as Americans, believe, as I do, that we Americans have a responsibility to help families outside of the U.S. to the fullest extent of our abilities when those families have loved ones who go missing here. I also remind you, before some of you get judgy, that Natasha, in interviewing Mary, does not have 350 interviews of experience like I do. In addition, Natasha had her work cut out for her because Mary was a very emotional guest. As proof, even if you don't speak Spanish, please check out the unedited original in Spanish interview between Natasha and Mary that I have made available on Unfound's YouTube channel. This then led to Consuela also having a challenging time as an amateur translator portraying Mary trying to convert into English what Mary was saying. Yes, this is very experimental. I don't know when Unfound will do something like this again. But I made a promise to Mary that Nancy's disappearance would be featured on Unfound even though I can't speak Spanish. This is how I tried to fulfill that promise. One more thing. My instruction to Consuela in translating Mary was for her to play it very calm and low-key, almost bland. This is in direct contrast to how Mary was in the actual interview. I gave Consuela this instruction because I thought her trying to be emotional, like Mary was, would come across as very tacky and fake. And I did not want this to become some kind of parody of a real interview. Hi, I'm Natasha, and I'm here with the mother of Nancy Troche Garcia, Mari. Mari, how are you? I continue to wait. It's been five years, and I don't know anything about my daughter. No answers, nothing. It's been so long. Okay, now we're going to talk in detail about the case. Here in the United States, there are reports. There is one report in Charlie Project, very well recognized, and also in the website, the project, NamUs. In NamUs, the case number is MP56775. And they're telling us that the date she went missing is May 19th, 2018. The 20th. That was the last day we saw her. Okay, that's important. So she disappeared May 20th, 2018. From Asheboro, North Carolina, here in the United States. Well, we can start before all of this. We want to know her as a person, Nancy. Can you talk about your family, please, Mari? How many sons or daughters do you have and describe typical family life? In my home, my daughter started working since she was 13 years old. Can you talk about your family, please, Mari? How many sons or daughters do you have and describe family life? I have my home. My daughter, since she was 13 or 14 years old, started working in the local harvest community, picking broccoli. She was very hardworking, very independent. I have four sons, three that are married. I'm left with one bachelor. My daughter knew how to work. I don't know why they did this to me. 
I don't understand. You can't imagine the pain that it caused the whole family to realize she was gone. When we were told she was gone, it was so horrible. Yes. So of the five kids, who were the sons, who were the daughters, and where does Nancy fall? Was she the first? No, Nancy was the third. Then one male, then one female, then came Nancy, then another male, and the last is also male. All right, thank you. And we're calling you in Mexico, and you live in Mexico, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, focusing on Nancy, what are her interests, hobbies, her work, education? What are the things that she liked to do? She studied until high school, then dedicated herself to work, to move forward in life. She worked all the time, all day. I see. She would go to the dances. That's where she met people. That's where she fell in love with that person. I see. How did she end up living in North Carolina? The person she met here took her as his fiance. They were married there and he arranged her papers. She separated from him because he gave her a very bad life. He hit her. They told me he would take her out by her hair when it was very cold on the street. I didn't know. They didn't want to, t to hurt my feelings, so they didn't tell me about her life as it really was. He never gave her a dollar of his when she was there. His mother was the one who took care of the food. He never gave her any money. Then when she started working, making graphics on t-shirts, I don't know what that's called. All right, so let's talk about this person. This isn't his real name, but for the purposes of this program, we'll call him Robert. They met in Mexico, and then they were married. Is Robert Mexican or American? Mexican. He's Mexican. He's from this community. So they're both American citizens? Yes. All his family has papers. My daughter's papers expired, but when she married, she renewed. But when she renewed, she did as an abused woman. They give them papers. And because of that, she is able to stay. All right. Nancy grew up speaking English? Or how did she learn? Okay, so she had to learn it in the United States, right? Yes, until she separated from that person, she started to going to school to learn English. Oh, that's great. How long was she with Robert? Like more than a year. I don't remember exactly, but maybe one and a half or two years. And when did she arrive to the United States? 2011, I think. I wrote it down, but I forget. It's fine, Mari. Well, despite all that, did she like living in the United States? Yes. She said it was a better life. Here, the way people live, it's more relaxed. But over there, there's more opportunities to, make, to work and to make more money. She also liked being here in her country. Clearly. Had she visited the United States before? Or is this the first time? Her? Yes. It was her first time, yes. Then she came back to Mexico, but went back to the United States to work. It was the first time when he took her. She lived with Robert, Robert's mom, anyone else? Robert's daughters. I don't remember if it was one or two daughters. Two daughters and their father. All right. Moving forward from all that, you were telling me, I don't know if they divorced or if she just escaped. 
And from there, did she return back to Mexico? No, she didn't come home. They separated. They divorced. She moved and um, she worked at a different place. She wasn't in the same place. All right, so they divorced or no? Yes. Then she fell in love. His fictitious name is David after that. So how long was it from Robert to David that she met David? She met him at her new job, but didn't get together with him for one or two years. All right, so they met at work. The new job, yes. Do you remember what type of work it was? They upholstered furniture. I see, and how was her relationship with David in general? In the beginning, like all relationships, good. But then as they started to know each other, the problems started as well. Then she wasn't fine with him but she stayed with him when she became pregnant with her daughter. All right, so she was living with David, alone with David, when she became pregnant, or was there someone else? Does David have any other sons or daughters? One daughter at the time. She was 10 years old. He also lived with his mom, his sister, and his dad as well. She lived with them for a while, and then when things weren't good anymore, they separated and she rented an apartment. I see. So how long did she live with David? Approximately until they separated. Maybe a year and a half or two years. All right. So they separated. She was expecting, and then she moved to her apartment alone and she was there in her apartment with her baby alone yes only he didn't care for the baby he didn't seek out the baby he didn't want the baby and then i saw messages advising her to look for the baby's father so that the baby can have a father so she started sending david messages for him to visit his daughter. She took the baby to be cared for by his mom, and later the family began to endear themselves to the baby and him to the baby. Before she disappeared, they were getting ready to sue for custody of the baby. She loved her so much. She was everything in her life. She was born in December. My daughter didn't let anyone visit her baby or people that were sick or take her out of the apartment because she didn't want her baby to get sick. The baby was premature seven months. She took very good care of her. She gave her whole life for her. That's why I think they betrayed her, tricked her because she would never abandon her baby. She would never leave her. They said she went to Mexico because I was sick, but that wasn't true. It was a lie. I wasn't sick, and she loved her baby. She would never leave her, especially with them. As she was alone, she didn't know who would help her take care of her baby. She had already mentioned that she would try to find someone else to take care of the baby while she worked. All right, and that never happened? No, not anymore. Nancy, she was alone in the apartment. Who didn't let the baby leave the house? Was it Nancy or was it the baby's dad? Leave the apartment? Yes. She was alone in the apartment taking care of her. The baby was born in December. As it is very cold in December, she wouldn't take the baby out for any reason as she didn't want her to get sick. Okay. The pictures she would send of her little girl when she would take her out in the car, she adored her. She would always present her very well put together with sunglasses. She was everything in the world to her. They say she left her. That is not the truth. It seems like 
Nancy's life here in the United States was very hard. Yes. Because at first she arrived with Robert. Everything was very ugly. They separated, eventually getting divorced. Then she had to move and stay in an apartment by herself before meeting David and her new apartment. And with that, for a time she was living in David's house along with another daughter of David's. Eventually they separated. So Nancy had to have her own daughter in her apartment, her new apartment by herself. Since the baby was left in the hospital when she left, she would have to drive the very next day, one or two hours to go to the hospital to breastfeed her. She suffered a lot and cared a lot for her daughter. So she didn't abandon her daughter as they want people to think. How long was the baby in the hospital in such a delicate state? It was about five days to a week. I don't remember every detail. It's been so long with so many things in my head, millions of things that, that have happened over there. I don't remember exactly, but about a week. It seems to me that Nancy has a lot of strength. Being alone here with all this hasn't been easy. I'm not sure if you were aware if David was helping with the costs of the baby, if he was giving her money for that. Like I told you at the beginning, he didn't care for her, so he didn't give her anything until she started to message him to see his daughter so she could know her father. Then later, um, one or two months later, because that's how long she stayed home caring for the baby. Then she began taking the baby to his mother. In time, one or two months, he began to give her money. Then, now, let's speak a little bit about Mexico. To be clear, did Nancy ever talk about going back to Mexico to live with her daughter? No, she only wanted to bring her so we could meet her since we couldn't go there, but now I can go there. She only wanted to bring her so we could meet her. The baby, not just her alone. Yes. Which is why I told the police she did not abandon her baby. She did not abandon her baby. Right, it must have been very difficult for you because it was so difficult for Nancy all this time my life is over. Life is over. Because it's impossible to celebrate anything. Something's missing. Heart. It's worse because I don't know where she is. I don't know if she's alive or not alive. Or suffering. It's an impotence. These are things that I don't tell anyone that are happening to me. Well, I can share with you that since this is a program of missing persons, apparently it's very common to hear your state also in other cases because people say their life stopped the day of the disappearance. It just stopped completely. That's common, Mari. At any point, did Nancy mention that she was scared of David? Not to me, but she told her sister. Okay. And when was the last time that you spoke to Nancy? And how did it go? It was by telephone, right? By phone. It was in May, but I don't remember. First few days of May, then she disappeared. The 20th, she always sent me my present for Mother's Day. Oh, and when is Mother's Day in Mexico? Is it different than in the United States? What was the date? The 10th of May. Oh, she sent you a gift. How nice. Yes, she sent me money to buy myself a gift. 
she was always attentive of all those things. Birthday, Mother's Day, Father's Day, she would always send so we could buy a gift. Oh, that's so nice. What a great person, a great daughter. Very good. Yes. And when was the last time that you saw her? I think she returned to Mexico one time, right? To visit? One time. One time, yes, since they were going to operate me. She came to be with me in the hospital. Okay. And how did she seem? Changed from how she was before. More loving, more more of a good person with us, with everyone. She lasted two weeks and then returned. Okay, and when was that? Do you remember the year? I don't remember exactly, but it was about a year and a half because they operated me in June, I think. In July. In 2016? Yes, around there, more or less, but yes. Now we're going to talk of that day, the 20th of May, 2018. Okay, what is the official version? They didn't tell me an official version. Okay. They only told me she had disappeared and nothing else. Then when I was able to travel there, they told me that maybe she had gone with a boyfriend. How could she have left her five-and-a-half-month-old baby? I explained that that was not possible, that she breastfed her baby, that she would not have left her. All that I asked the police was to help me. They didn't help me. They couldn't help me. Okay. Look in the lakes. Look in the rivers search they can't i've asked for more things why don't they do them they tell me they themselves cannot do it all right nancy was going to drop off her baby to have someone take care of her right who was going to take care of her and in which house her mother-in-law's the mother of her partner she took care of her in her house is it another house separate from David's, or is it the same house? It's the same house. All right, so she disappeared right after that, right? Yes. Is there any proof of anything? Anything at all to validate the story? No. Okay, who was the last person to see Nancy? I spoke from Mexico to his mother, and he said that he stayed waiting for the baby. And to the police, they told them that one of his sisters had received her. Okay. Two different versions. Okay. And the mother, and the mother of David, nothing? According to her, she was with him having breakfast. I've told, I've told the police what they did to my daughter, they planned very well. Because she didn't have friends. She didn't have many people that she knew. Okay. I went around and asked the neighbors to see if they had seen anything. I. I came across a neighbor from across the street and she told me that my daughter would come out and sit on her stairs with her baby and she would dance with her and play with her. She was small, but she would play with her. She said nothing about parties nor music. She was just devoted to her baby. She said, your daughter is an exemplary daughter of which do not exist in the United States because she was not a bad mother to that baby. She was a mother very exemplary to her. Very dedicated. That's what the neighbor said to me. My daughter did not know the neighbor. I see. 
but the neighbor watched her how she was. Oh, how beautiful. Such good news. My head thinks of so many things. What they did to her, the way they took her baby away from her. The things that I think about. What can I do? Nothing. Well, now we are together and we are going to help Nancy on this program. That's fine. After that day, who began to get worried about Nancy? Coworkers, her friend. She didn't have many friends either. She never showed up for work on Monday. She began to get worried, thinking maybe the baby got sick. Or that something happened to her leaving work. She went to see what happened. But she wasn't. But my daughter wasn't there. Nancy was not in her house. Nor the car, nor anything. So she thought she wasn't there. So she left. She came back the next day. I think she asked to leave a little bit early and returned back to the apartment where she lived. She left notes, call me, I came looking for you, and nothing. The next day she began asking where the mother of her ex-partner lived, and she went looking for her, and she asked, and she was surprised because Nancy would never leave her daughter, especially with them. They told her she left her because she was going to Mexico. And nobody that knows Nancy and how she was with her baby. Nobody believes. Nobody believes this. And who commented this? Was it David's mom? David? Or who said that? Do you remember? It was a sister of his. David's sister commented that Nancy went to Mexico. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you, Mari. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the next day and the next week. Who finally figured out that something was not right? When they told her that the daughter was there, but they didn't know anything about Nancy. Then she communicated back here to an aunt because she didn't have our phone number. She communicated to Nancy's aunt through Facebook. So then she dialed and communicated with her. That's when we found out. So that day, do you remember how many days you had to wait? From the 20th, when she disappeared, until you realized? Three days. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And that day, Wednesday, was when we found out. We found out Wednesday in the morning. Okay. And was it the friend that called or the aunt that called? The aunt. Okay. The friend called the aunt and told her. And so she told us and we began calling. Her and everybody there. Nobody knew anything. It's as if the earth had swallowed her. Her car, her. For us, nothing has changed since that day. You obviously called Nancy. She did not answer. You called her aunt. Well, her aunt called you. Who else did you call? We called Marilu, a niece that lived in Chicago to see if she could go to North Carolina. To see what was happening and she went. Same, she was searching and asking everything. Nobody had seen her. Okay, one of Nancy's nieces went from Chicago to North Carolina. Cousin actually, because she's Nancy's father's niece. Oh, cousin. Okay. She went from Chicago to North Carolina immediately. And who is Muddy Lou? The friend, right? Yes. 
the friend that told us. Okay, thank you for the information. Now we're going to talk about the police. When were they alerted about Nancy's case? The police from the United States. I only know she went to the house on Tuesday, the day she went to ask about the baby at the ex-partner's house. And they told her she wasn't there, that she had gone to Mexico. So she said, well, then I'm going to create a report with the police. That's when she went to the police. This is Muddy Lou? Yes. Okay. All right. So she made the report. Was there anything they could do? Nothing. What have you asked of them and they of you throughout your ongoing contact with them? Nothing. I ask them to help me find my daughter. I've asked them to look in the lakes and the rivers. Maybe the car is there. I asked them to race this across the entire United States. Some form of communication. I asked them to raise an Amber Alert. They told me no. She was already an adult. It could not be raised. That. I've asked them for one thing or another. And nothing, no one helps me. They tell me they're doing their job. I know for me, it's little what they do, but I don't know if that's what they can do. I don't know. How old was Nancy? Yes, Nancy was 28 years old. Okay. The baby was five and a half months or six months, something along those lines. Okay, when I spoke earlier with you, I think you told me that the police were asking you for DNA, right? So something like her hair, and what was the result of that? The detective, the detective that did the investigation. I don't know. He didn't do anything. He didn't do his job well. I feel like he didn't do his job right. After a while, when the rent on the apartment wasn't paid, I told the translator I wanted to collect my daughter's belongings and bring back as much as I could. They told me they weren't my things. Why am I asking for them for myself? That they weren't mine. I told them they were my daughter's, and they told me I couldn't take anything out. That's what the detective told me. A month later, more or less a month later, there was a sign on the door that if the belongings were not removed, they would be taken outside to be taken by the garbage. And it was the cousin from Chicago who went with me to the apartment so they could give us the key to open the home so we could take her things. So after we took everything out, I came home. Half a year later, I went back, same, nothing. And where I had left my daughter's things, they were no longer there. That's when they asked me for hair or a toothbrush or something. We weren't able to take anything like that out. I looked through her clothes and hair was the only thing that I could find. That was after a year, I think that was. I was looking for hair to give to the detective because they hadn't collected anything. The house was the same. The room was intact. Nobody had moved anything. As her mother, pardon me, were you able to find hair for DNA? And did you give that to the police? Yes. How great. <laughs> that is spectacular. Okay. In her apartment, could you guess what happened or it's like she left like a normal day? Yes, that's how they left it. Like any normal day. Because she wasn't leaving. Because she, she was taking the baby. Like I was telling you, it was time for custody. They wanted to start a custody fight for her. 
and she was left with sharing the baby with the ex, the father of the baby. She lent him the baby on Sunday, but he had her all week in his house. And only to be bothersome, he asked for the baby on Sunday. So she took the baby there with him. She left, she wanted to put gas. And from there, no one saw her again. Okay, who said that she was going to get gas? The police told me. Oh, okay. But I asked them. I asked them. I was able to go after one month, the time needed to get my visa. So I asked the police, what about the camera footage at the gas station and surrounding area? And they told me there were no cameras anywhere. In particular, the footage at the gas station had already been recorded over because time had passed, which is why I'm saying the detective made an error. He didn't do his job. He did not place any attention in anything because in the staircase, he told me that she left with another man. Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Thank you, Mari. I would like to clarify one point. They were already in matters of the care of the baby. So they were already with lawyers to continue. No. Not yet. Okay. No, they were going to start. Because my daughter went to ask to those that are free that do not charge. Yes, yes. They told her they couldn't take her case because he had already beaten her to it. They were already taking his case. They couldn't accept her. So she went to other attorneys, but they wanted to charge her $3,500 or $2,500. And she would say, where am I going to get that? That's why they were just starting to fight for the custody for the baby. Okay. 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 Thank you, Mari. Was there anything substantial that was missing from her apartment, such as her suitcase, her makeup, her medication? Something that she needed? No, nothing. No, everything was left in place. Nothing was missing. The only thing that I discovered when I removed everything already after two years is that she didn't have one picture. There wasn't one piece of paper. There wasn't even one photo. All of her papers were missing. That was already after one or two years that I started really investigating her things because I didn't have the courage. And who had her things at that time? Where were her things? Oh, where? At a house of a distant family member of ours. I believe. Is that a family member from David's family or your family? It was a cousin of Nancy's father. Oh, okay, so it was on your side. Yes. And her phone, where is it? Were you able to review, are there any archives? No, no. The only thing we were not able to find is her bag, where she would always carry her bag with her cell phone, with her passport. Were there messages that you were able to see or not? No, no, we weren't able to find any of that. All right, well, there's something in English. It's called pings. It's like this. Here I am talking on my phone, on my mobile, and there are cell towers that allow communication with the phone. Do you have that information of the cellular communication with the towers? No. 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 She brought some cell phones. A tablet from here. The cell phones. Well, now they're old. 
Yes, I gathered those things, as many things as I could, and I brought them back to Mexico. And I don't remember, I sent them with the hope that there would be something on the cell phone, some proof of something. I sent them to see if they could be unblocked, to see what they contained. So they turned them on, but I did not reset the data from her cellular. So the police said these cell phones were already turned on. I told them, I told them I'm the one that brought them back with me because they weren't doing anything. So after three years, I handed over to the police her old cell phones and tablet because they did not collect anything. Then after three years, I took to the police her tablet, her old cell phones, everything. After bringing them back with me, I went to return them back over there because they didn't investigate anything. They didn't do their job in anything. Thank you, Mari. Good job. Okay, well, was there anything useful from her cell phones or tablet? Anything important that you can tell us? No, nothing. Well, they didn't have anything. When they were turned on, it looked like the location was here in Mexico. I didn't see anything, nor did I think there was anything to see, along with the man that was analyzing. Yes, I understand. I understand. Then the police told me that she's there in Mexico. That is where her mail was open. No, that's because I brought everything back with me. I understand. I thought they already did their investigation. They recovered everything that was occupied. Everything else I can bring back with me. But no, it wasn't like that. Thank you, Mari. The public account is that she made a few phone calls after her disappearance from her cell phone. Do you know those phone numbers? Or who she was calling? I think she made two phone calls out of state. No, they didn't tell me. They didn't tell me anything about that. Okay, perfect. And now we're going to talk about her car. Her car disappeared with her, correct? Yes. Okay, here in the United States, there's a bolo, be on the lookout. It is something official for the police. We're trying to find this car. This is her license plate. Do you know if they did anything like that? Like an alert? No. The only thing they told me is that they had asked about departures from the U.S. to Mexico from the embassy to see if maybe the car passed through or if she left. But no, nothing. Okay. Okay. And how old is the car? Did she have it for a long time or no? It was sold already old. As a used car, she didn't know how to drive in Mexico, but there it is indispensable to know how to drive. She learned how to drive there. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. So they sold her that car that was already used. So then they sold her that old car that was already used and then it broke down. Then a new car, the mechanic, after she disappeared. Okay, what is that new car? No, I don't have any information about that. They did not give it to me. I don't know anything about that. Perhaps the car dealership picked it up. I don't know. All right, well, the data that we have here from the report is that it is a burgundy color. 2001 Chevrolet Impala with license plate from North Carolina DFD 2191 okay yes the license plate I don't know because they didn't give it to me but that is the car yes okay and on the other hand I'm reading the report from Charlie Project that there is no proof that Nancy flew to Mexico from the local airport 
That is what the detective told me. Every year there's a new detective, and they told me that she didn't leave. Her car was never found, so that's why I asked them, why don't you look in the rivers and the lakes? Maybe that's where it is. Up until now, I took notice. They said they are not able to do that. They can't even ask for help so that others may do so. That is what they told me. To look, I'm tired of asking them. Then I asked if they could inquire with the FBI for help because this is a life that's tired. All the time, thinking, suffering. Then they tell me they're managing the case well. The investigation is going well. They told me the FBI did not want to take the case. I don't know why not. All right. Thank you, Nancy. And then on the other hand, have you tried to communicate with the FBI directly or not yet? I walked with a gentleman looking and searching to get to the point where we would be able to talk to the FBI. But they told us if it is not requested by the police, then the FBI cannot enter the case. All right, thank you, Mari. Now we're going to talk about Mexico. Were you able to find help from the police or the government of Mexico? No, time had passed. She had already disappeared for one month. I went, I came back, I came back here. I went to those that help immigrants, human rights, for them to guide me. What can I do? Where can I go? And nothing. I don't know what more I can do. All right. Thank you, Mari. Now we're going to talk about David specifically. He had an interview with the police, correct? What did he have to say? Was he bothered? Helpful or not? No one. No one helped. No one made any effort to find her. No one gave support. No one framed anyone. No one helped in anything. Thank you, Mari. I have to ask, obviously, if David spoke to you directly, to you, the mother of Nancy. Did David talk to you about what happened? No one has given me their face for anything. Thank you, Mari. So to be clear, it was David's sister that was the last to see her. Is that right? Yes. Thank you, Mari. In Mexico, on the border, are they looking for her car or not? No. Over there, the FBI did not make a report. And at the border, they are not looking to see if the car entered or left. No. Okay, thank you, Mari. We return back to the United States. How tough is it dealing with American authorities? Very difficult. Very difficult. I don't know English. I don't understand anything in English until they find a translator because they don't know how to speak Spanish. I don't know if what I say is said well, if it is translated well. I don't know because since they don't know how to speak Spanish and I don't know how to speak English, Thank you, Mari. It's difficult that way. Yes, it's very difficult. You don't live here. No. And the languages, the two languages. You've had help from volunteers. Would you like to talk about them, please? They help me, some ladies, by allowing me to stay in their house. When I go, they give me food for the month that I last. And I ask them, help me, what can I do? Where can I go? Nothing of that because I don't know where to go. Okay, thank you. How many times have you visited the United States? Because of Nancy's case. I go every six months or when I can handle a bit longer. During COVID, it was one year and three months that I didn't go during the time that COVID lasted. Since during that time, it was not allowed to enter. But since then, I go every year or every six months. 
to see what else. Nothing. So it has already been about seven or eight times by now, right? Yes. All right, thank you. Now we're heading towards the conclusion. How bad have these past eight years been for you since Nancy arrived in the United States? How difficult? Oh, life stops the moment they give you the information. I'm telling you, all celebrations stop. There are no more celebrations for me, nor for my kids. There's no New Year's festivities. No celebration of Mother's Day, Father's Day, no celebrations whatsoever. One doesn't have humor, nor any desire to celebrate, because one knows that something is missing. It's more after all these years. I don't know if she's alive, if she's suffering. After all this, it's not a life. We're actually living in hell. We're actually living hell on earth. Thank you, Mari. So every time that you went to visit the United States, were you able to see your granddaughter? Yes, they let me see her, but only in their house and with someone there next to me. Never with the baby alone? Never with the baby alone, no. As if I was going to bring her back to Mexico. It's as if they're scared, but I do not know of what. Yes, they let me see her with vigilance. Thank you, Mari. And finally, do you have a website dedicated to the disappearance of Nancy to help out in the case? I think you also have a Facebook page. Is that correct? I don't know. I'm not sure if it was published. I don't know if you can enter or not, but the police, I do believe have a Facebook page, I think. Thank you. And for the conclusion, is there anything else that you'd like to tell us? Anything else that you'd like to say? I want help because I've encountered people that take advantage of my pain, that they take advantage of my situation. And only in that way would they help me by talking to people who are more influential so that the case continues. I don't want them to take advantage of me. I want them to help me with no intention that I should help them. Help me, tell me what to do, to make an impression with the police, to know about my daughter. That is what I want. Mari, thank you so much for being on this program. And now we are going to end the interview. Thank you so much, Mari. We will be in touch. And that was the English translation of Natasha's December 16th, 2023 interview with Mary Garcia, mother of Nancy Troche Garcia. In this translation, Natasha portrayed herself while her friend Consuela portrayed Mary. If you desire to listen to the actual Spanish interview between Natasha and Mary, please find it on Unfound's YouTube channel. I first thank Mary for joining me and all of you on this episode. Second, I thank Natasha for being open to this crazy plan and for following my instructions to a T. I thank her for putting in all her work to completing the interview and the translation. Third, and last, although surely not least, I thank Consuela, who I don't personally know, who went along with her friend Natasha's idea to be a translator for this episode. To all three of you, thank you. Okay then, my summation. The theories would be a lot less plentiful if Nancy's ex-boyfriend had been the last one to see her. Obviously. In addition, and maybe the overlooked part of this case, if only Nancy had disappeared and not her car too, the theories would be a lot less plentiful. Why? Because in these general types of scenarios, when a woman disappears like this, with someone or people telling stories that can't be verified, the man said, or in this case, the woman said type, 
The details are she got in a car with someone we don't know and left. She walked off by herself. The details aren't she drove off in her own car. What also causes this disappearance to not be your standard the man said or the woman said type is that usually in this kind of case, when children or custody of children is involved, and we might think the father of the children is the perpetrator, those kids are usually sheltered away from the missing woman's family. The family has no contact with them. However, this is not the situation with Mary. The ex-boyfriend has given her access to her grandchild when she has come from Mexico. The other issue is we must consider that many women suffer from depression after having a child and that although Nancy seemed to be doing okay, that doesn't mean she was. We must also contemplate this idea. Nancy might have been telling the truth about her intention to go back to Mexico at least for a little while, but then something happened. She fell asleep at the wheel and ran off the road for example. But yes, I know, many of you will default to the ex-boyfriend as being most likely responsible for Nancy's disappearance. I get it. But I think you know by now that on this podcast, you will always get the most honest portrayal of a disappearance in plain English. If you'd like to hear and read more of my analysis regarding the disappearance of Nancy Troche Garcia, please go to patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast, sign up and partake in the unfound blog. Until then, I leave the public theorizing up to you. And that's the program. Right now, while you are in your podcast platform, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, wherever, give Unfound a five-star review, a thumbs up, whatever that platform allows. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've just finished this episode of Unfound.